Salutations, one and all. This is Don Number One and Mecca. Hi. And we are presenting Chapter Four, my Fire Emblem Eleven Hard Five Zero Percent Girls Playthrough. Chapter Four gives us the preparations menu, and with that, we get access to reclassing and forging. Reclassing is pretty neat because it gives us uh, the ability to let some of our units consider new career paths. For example, Jagan has always wanted to be a dragon rider, and now finally he can become one. He just ditches his horse, gets on a dragon and flies away. That gives us a horse to spare, and Navarre will gladly make use of that horse because he's always wanted to ride a pony. He's kind of bad at it though, kind of vulnerable to losing his balance, so he doesn't take any weapons along. Then there is um, Barst who has seen how good a bandana looks on Daros and decides he wants that too. So he puts on a bandana and now he can walk on water. In the meanwhile, uh, Marth goes to the armor and he decides that he needs to buy a very expensive present for his love interest, Sita. So he asks the armorer to make him the most expensive weapon forge that money can buy, and the armorer agrees. He says, Marth, I will make you this forge wing spear with plus 6 might and plus 10 hit, and you can give it to your lovely little lady and name it the Glue Factory. Um, in addition, Marth also picks up a heel staff for our old man, Riss. The glue factory is going to be pretty important in this chapter and for the entire run, in fact. Um, there is a bunch of cavaliers near the gate that we need to seize, and they are the main threat of this map because they come towards you and you have a lot of move, and they get in the way. So we're going to have to kill them with the glue factory, among others. Um, the other threat in this map is uh, the group of fighters near the starting point that also try to rush you. For casual players, they are a big pain to fight because they deal a lot of damage, like the fighters in the last map and they kind of create a sort of pincer attack, but if you play as quickly as we do, or as Dun Dun does, um, they actually don't factor in the, into the map at all, because we can just, uh, they never catch up to us. Even though you have two groups that threaten us from the very beginning, there's actually not very much to do in the first couple of turns, aside from considering the enemies. Uh, there's this lone thief who's caught in the wrong place at the wrong time, and our cavaliers dole out some slow punishment to him, because we want to uh, subject the thief to a slow and painful death so that he'll counterattack and do some damage to our cavaliers, and that actually enables Riss to use heal a couple of extra times in this chapter for extra staff up in EXP. This turn features the last armory visit in this game, and it's going to buy us a grand total of one steel lance. And the only reason we're doing this is because Jagan needs an extra weapon that's kind of strong, but not his silver lance, because it only has like three uses left and we need to conserve it for a couple of occasions. So we make sure to buy that and trade it to him. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of things going on in the first few turns. We're just preparing for these Cavaliers. It does help that a lot of characters that we get use Steel Lances, and they're also Cavaliers, so they have occasional utility slightly later in the game. Um, on this enemy phase, Jinx's positioning is important because it allows two of the Cavaliers to end up in certain places that will be beneficial to us in the next player phase. And Jagan being a Draco Knight is actually very important because he needs to be wielding an Iron Axe in order for those two Cavaliers to attack him while the other Cavalier attacks Sita and suicides on her. And Sita um, use, makes use of her Wing Spear Forge to uh, one to KO another Cavalier on this player phase, thereby eliminating about half of the threat. Um, the other half of the threat is still there though, and we need to use a lot of weak units to kill them off, and to give them space to uh, kill them off without getting attacked by the other enemies that are positioned near the bridge. We put Kane in a very precise spot to make sure that uh, the archers cannot move out to attack other units, and they also cannot attack Kane because the armor that doesn't move, the enemy armor, is in the way. So that's a very precise way of moving things, and also very precise damage management because we only barely manage to get the kills we need to. Right, not only in terms of damage, but also in terms of movement, because characters such as uh, Barst, Board, and Caster just barely have enough movement to take care of the enemies that Jagan lured to just the right place. It seems you've overlooked one of the Cavaliers, and he breaks right through our lines and attacks Lena, but thankfully he is such a scrub that he cannot even one round kill our weak healer, and he only does half damage. Yeah, that's a generic Cavalier. Just kidding. His name is Mathis. According to the canon, he's Lena's sister, and his battle speech is like, Lena, what I would give to see your face before I die, and he just stabs her in the face instead. Lena is like, don't do that, and just recruits him to the side, and Mathis decides to make himself useful and lure the horsemen over there. And meanwhile, we just take care of the enemies on the bridge. Um, we're being helped by a new character. His name is Merrick, 
and he's the mage that just joined us by visiting the village. Uh, Merrick is very powerful, he comes with the Excalibur Tome that um, he can use at a very low weapon level, surprisingly. Excalibur is great in a lot of ways, it has a lot of uses, it's very powerful, it hits resistance, so that's extra damage rather than it hit on defense. And it's one to range, so Merrick can use it without getting countered most of the time, and that's a very helpful tool in dispatching of large patches of enemies. We've ignored the final threat in this chapter, and they are two horsemen that were uh, where the Cavalier started. These horsemen are really fast, and they double a lot of our units. Um, but here we divert their attention because Mathis is very low luck, and they prefer to have as much crit as they can on whoever they attack. The positioning of our Cavaliers allows Sita to be just on the edge of her range, such that she can one-hit KO the enemy boss. The enemy boss's uh, battle speech is also a bit strange in that he says we may defy him, but we will never defeat him. Well, Sita definitely proves him wrong by one-hit KOing him with the four Twin Spear. Yeah, we're all ready to wrap up this chapter, except Martha is nowhere near the gate. But thankfully, we have the warp staff available on Lena, so she will be able to save two turns of boring walking by just warping him over. Our first uh, warp use in the game is not a very exciting one, it doesn't like skip an entire map all by itself, but two turns is what we can expect that the average warp use to save at this point in the game. So that's chapter 4, completed in 5 turns, we will see you next time. See ya.